Welcome to the Discover Prophetic Truth in Scripture broadcast with your host, Dr. Anthony Earl. We will unpack the Word so that the strategies of God can be revealed. This program airs daily at 8 a.m. Pacific, 10 a.m. Central, 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Follow us in studying the entire Bible this year. We pray that this teaching helps to bring God's Word to life and gives you practical application to enhance your daily living. Let's go right into today's teaching. So here we are in the book of Daniel. We began Daniel on today and God has given us a good study for today. As we invite Holy Spirit in, Holy Spirit, come now, give us the insight, touch our ears, strike our hearts, give us the words to declare, help us to comprehend now, parakletos, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So here we are going into Daniel and our theme for today, there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. God is the God who reveals secrets. All other gods, they have mouths, but they cannot speak. Eyes, they cannot see. Ears, they cannot hear. Hands, they cannot touch. These dumb idols cannot deliver. But there is one true God. He is the only God. And he reveals secrets to his people. Secrets are defined as something that is kept secret, hidden, or concealed. Kept from the knowledge of any but the initiated or privileged. We have been initiated into the kingdom of God. We've received Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We've confessed our sins. We have repented. God relented. God gave his son that we may have the right to the tree of life. Secret things belong to God, but the things revealed belongs to us and to our children forever. So God is revealing things to us that we pass on to the succeeding generations. And it's to follow generations to come. Yes. And that we may follow all the words of the law, that we may be obedient to the precepts and the statutes, the commands and the judgments of God. This is why we study the book daily, line upon line, precept upon precept. Today, we start our journey in Daniel. Daniel names means judge or God judges. God is judge. In the ancient Hebrew judges means to govern. So Dan, Daniel is a person embedded into a Babylonian and Persian system to govern. God will put his people in places to impact it. And we are people who are carriers of grace. Write that in the comments. I am a carrier of grace. Believe and trust that God speaks to you and God gives you words to exhort others, to encourage others. Daniel helps us to understand God's process. So as we study Daniel, we can see that he is part of those who are in exile. And God has allowed the enemy to, to shut down the religious system in Jerusalem. And as Ezekiel taught us, Ezekiel showed us that God moved out of Jerusalem and he followed his people. Where we go, God is there. Where two or three are gathered together, he is there in the midst of them. And, and Ezekiel, Ezekiel, Ezekiel revealed to us how God, God is committed to his people and he is determined to turn our hearts back to him. So as we continue, in Proverbs, Proverbs remind us of the obstructions that attempt to interfere with our movement, how the enemy is looking for an opportune time to defeat us, how we must guard ourselves from harlotry and adultery. We must be loyal to our own spouses, drinking water from our own cisterns. 
We must be committed to adhering to the instructions of our father and mother. We must be obedient to the decrees of God so that we can live successfully in this life. And then John, John continues with the pattern son revealing to us how Jesus operates. Jesus is our prototype. He is our example. He is our two pulse. So we study the Christ and we pattern our lives after him. He comes in the traditions of the prophets and the kings, but he is a higher frequency. He carries greater bandwidth. Yes. So we see how he dismantles the religious systems of in his time, religious systems that don't build people are going to be dismantled. So let's go right into Daniel. We have a lot to share within this hour time, Daniel. So Daniel, the author of Daniel is Daniel, dated late 6th century BC. The thing, God controls the destiny of all nations. Did you see that? God controls the destiny of America. He controls the nations in Europe, Asia, and Africa throughout the world. Key words here, king, kingdom, vision, dreams. Daniel means God is my judge. And he refers to himself in the first person several times between chapter 7, 15 and chapter 10, 12. His unshakable consecration to Yahweh and his loyalty to God's people strongly affirms that truth in his life. Jesus himself confirms Daniel as a prophet of great importance, Matthew 24. Daniel was likely born into an upper class family in Jerusalem. As a teenager, he was deported to Babylon where he lived over 60 years. Daniel initially served as a trainee in Nebuchadnezzar's court. He later became an advisor to foreign kings. Now understand that Daniel is the person who decoded that after 70 years, 70 years, that the people of God would be delivered. The date usually given for Daniel's captivity is 605 BC. His prophecy covers the time span of his life. Daniel's book covers two kingdoms, Babylon and Medo Persia, uh, Medo Persia and the reigns of four kings, Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, Darius, and Cyrus. The background. When King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians conquered Judah, they took thousands of captives and transported them to Babylon, known as the Babylon Exile. This number included the mighty men of valor, royal descendants, educated people, and skilled artisans from Jerusalem. The Babylonians had subdued all the provinces formerly ruled by Assyria and had consolidated their empire into an area that covered much of the Middle East. To govern such a diversified and vast kingdom required a skillful administrative bureaucracy. Captives who were educated or who possessed needed skills became the workforce for the government. The Babylonians selected young Hebrew men who were knowledgeable, wise, and good-looking to enter the training program. Four Hebrew men of good character stood out among the rest. Daniel, Belteshar, Hananiah, Shatrach, Mishael, Meshach, and Azariah, Abednego. Abednego. I thought I would just throw that in there. Daniel rose to excel all the wise advisors of that vast empire. The content, the book of Daniel has three main sections. Introduction to person of Daniel, chapter one, Daniel's key test of character and the development of his prophetic interpretation skills, chapters two through seven, and his series of visions about future kingdoms and events, chapters eight through 12. In this final section, Daniel emerges as a key prophetic book as it contains many insights into end time prophecies. Jesus comments in the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24 through 25, and many of the apostle 
Apostles, Paul's revelation find harmony of cohesion in Daniel. Most importantly, it becomes a, necess a necessary study companion to the book of Revelation. So do you see how prophetic insight is so important at, uh, in our time and was as important in the time of Daniel? Although the interpretation of Daniel, like Revelation, is subject to great diversity. For many, the dispensational approach has become quite popular. An interpretive approach sees keys in Daniel to help unlock the mysteries of such subjects as the Antichrist, the Great Tribulation, the Second Coming of Christ, the times of, Gen of the Gentiles, future resurrections and judgments. This approach also sees most unfulfilled prophecies as revolving around two major focal points. One the future destiny of the city of Jerusalem, and two, the future destiny of Daniel's people, national Jews. Personal application. One of the beautiful themes of this book is its emphasis on separation to God, consecrating yourself. With Daniel as the ultimate example, he teaches us how to be loyal and totally devoted 100% to our God. We can draw much truth from Daniel that helps us live with integrity and confidence in God's power and presence. Uncompromising integrity. We need to embrace this. We must see these patterns within Daniel's life and import those patterns into our lives from their decision not to eat the king's food to the refusal to bow, bow to the king's image. Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, display such an uncompromising spirit that spectacular opportunities open for God to display his power on their behalf. Now, keep in mind that in the book of Ezekiel, we've read over and over again, that God declared that he will make known himself to the nations. So God is looking to use you, use me to make known his name in the midst of people. So Daniel and the three friends, they were submitted and they were used mightily of God. Write that in the comment. God, use me mightily to declare your glory. Their courageous commitment presents a timeless challenge not to compromise our testimony of Jesus Christ. Even though we may go through a fiery furnace test, remember, the silver cup, the cup is for the silver and the furnace is for the gold. There is a testing, a fiery testing that God is bringing and taking us through so that we come to maturity, to perfection. The Lord promises to be with us as we trust him for protection and deliverance. God's absolute superiority over occult attempts to reveal, interpret spiritual mysteries. Try as they did. All the magicians, soothsayers, wise men, astrologers of the king's court could not arrive at the truth. The more we study the scriptures, the more we pray and seek the face of God, the more of the mysteries will be revealed to us and we can pass it on to succeeding generations. So we, what magicians and soothsayers and wise men and astrologers cannot arrive at, we can. This is an enduring encouragement to us. We can be confident that spiritual counterfeiters can never stand before the wisdom and the power of the Holy Spirit, God's supernatural abilities. The prophetic section of the book reminds us that God can predict major events hundreds of years in advance. This brings assurance that he knows all the details of our circumstances. He is present in our lives and will guide us safely through whatever trials we may face in the future. Prophetic key. According to many interpreters, Daniel 9 contains a pivotal prophecy. It has come to be known as Daniel's 70 weeks of years. An understanding of these weeks is crucial to one school of interpretation of latter-day prophetic events. Unfortunately, 
but understandably, the interpretation of this section is diverse among equally dedicated, committed Christians. These notes shall reflect the frequently accepted dispensational approach. However, additional in, in entries in certain footnotes and at the end of the section will address the more historic classical conservative view indicated by the words classical interpretation. Both are valid considerations for dedicated students to examine. And the exercise occasion, the healthy reminder that prophetic scripture interpretation is not a place for committed Christians to part company, although differences exist. So everyone may not believe the same thing, but at least it does not separate us. We understand that we are one body, every joint supply. And therefore we must understand that God gives various insights to people. Eventually through our pursuit of truth, we all will arrive at the same destination. As Daniel seeks the Lord to find out how long the Babylonian captivity will last, God shows him that Jeremiah's original prophecies indicating that the captivity would last 70 weeks would be extended to 77s or 490 years. This revelation, in fact, covers the history of Jerusalem and the Jews from the times of Artaxerxes decreed they should rebuild the city of Jerusalem to the time of the Great Tribulation. This whole period is called the times of the Gentiles because Gentiles political authority will be the major force until the final destruction of all Israel's enemy at the end of the Great Tribulation. This will culminate in the battle of Armageddon and the second advent of the Messiah. He will at that time destroy all the armies that have come against Jerusalem. The 77s are divided into three sections, seven weeks, 62 weeks, and one week. Each week represents seven years. The decree of Artaxerxes was in 446 through 445 B.C., Nehemiah 2.1. The first two sections of weeks total 69 or 483 years. This period ended in AD 32 when the Messiah was cut off or when Jesus was crucified on Calvary. The abomination of desolation, which Daniel prophesied would be part of the 70th week, was mentioned by Jesus as being part of the great tribulation or end time period. Nearly 2,000 years have passed and the 70th week has not happened. We are still living in the parathetical time called the times of the Gentiles, which precedes the culminating prophetic weeks. From this interpretive perspective, the book of Daniel unveils a march of events in God's relationship, not only with his people, but also with the world political system. Basic facts distilled from this book seems to illuminate other difficult passages presenting these apparent forthcoming events. One, the Messiah will return before the millennial period. Two, God's kingdom will literally be established on the earth with the Messiah king as ruler. Three, the four medals of Nebuchadnezzar's dream image symbolize four empires, Babylonian, Medio, uh, Persian, Macedonia, Greek, and Rome. Four, the fourth kingdom, Rome, will enjoy a last day revival in the form of a united confederacy. Out of this system, the Antichrist will emerge. Five, the false prophet and the Antichrist are persons, not merely a system. Six, God will continue to deal with the nations of Israel. Seven, national Israel is the prophetic time clock for last day events. So keep your eye on Israel. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem that they may prosper. Eight, the false prophet and the Antichrist will dominate the last portion of the last weeks of Daniel, 70 weeks of years. At the end of the week, after the great tribulation, Jesus the Messiah will return to establish the kingdom of God, which will resolve all the prophecies of Daniel. Classical inter interpretation. 
As previously indicated, the notion of the book of Daniel are interpreted using dispensational hermeneutical principles. In contrast to this prophetic approach, many evangelicals interpret Daniel using classical covenant hermeneutical principles. Classical interpreters do so realizing that biblical prophecies may have multiple levels of fulfillment. See note on the day of the Lord in Obadiah 15. And we keep pointing to Obadiah 15. So be sure to read the book of Obadiah. It's only just one chapter. The classical view sees the initial, initial fulfillment of Daniel's prophetic section in past historical events, such as the second century BC invasion of Jerusalem by Antiochus. Anti epiphanies and the events of the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. Classical interpreters do, however, also see ultimate fulfillment of many of the prophecies at the end of this age. For an example, see the notes on chapter 9, 26 and 27. Furthermore, the classical approach does not always press for strict literalness especially when the New Testament itself makes non-literal applications. For example, James quote, Amos, Christ revealed. Daniel communicates vivid pictures of Christ and his power and glory. Christ is believed to be the fourth man standing with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. The three had remained faithful to their God. Now God stands faithful with them in the fire and delivers them from the very smell of fire. In Daniel's night vision, he describes one like the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven, a reference to the second advent of Jesus Christ. Daniel sees a man in a vision whose description is very similar to John's description of Christ found in Revelation. The Holy Spirit at work two powerful kings, Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar, recognize that the spirit of God is in Daniel. Throughout the book, the Holy Spirit empowers Daniel to interpret the meaning of dreams and grant him supernatural insight to make predictive prophecies with current and future applications. Write this in the comment. Holy Spirit, give us wisdom and understanding of our dreams of prophetic insight, prophecy spoken. Daniel chapter one. In, this, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hands. And some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the articles into the treasure house of his gods. Do you notice that they thought their gods were superior? The third year of Jehoiakim was 605 BC. Shinar is another term for Babylon, modern southeastern Iraq. Verse three, then the king instructed, Asphenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. So many, many of us, we see that our academic institutions are trying to uh, persuade our children away from their Christian roots, but know that there are children who are like Daniel and the Hebrew boys who are firm in their devotion and they will matriculate through the best universities, the Ivory Leagues, and they will not bow down. But God uses these systems to give us insight, to position us with great favor so that we can impact others. God is interested in the affluent, the educators, the physicians, the scientists, the archaeologists. God is just as interested in them as he is on, uh, interested in the broken and the poor, the abandoned, the stranger. Verse 5. 
And the king appointed from them a daily provision of the king's delicacy and of the wine which he drank and three years of training for them so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. So the king was teaching them the best stuff about their culture so that they could represent. But yet God was embedding them in the midst of a Babylonian society so that eventually Babylon would be overtaken by Persia and that Daniel and the Hebrew boys would be strategically embedded in that system. God is strategically embedding you in systems. He's strategically placing you on jobs. He's strategically building new relationships for you so that you can be you can be a lamp, a light that show people how to step out of their dark place. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah are theoprophic names. Names meaning named after gods, which means they contain a reference to their God and express praise to Yahweh. Two basic Hebrew names for God are El and Yahweh. Daniel and Mishael contains reference to El, why Hananiah and Azariah contains a form of Yah. So as you study the scriptures, pay attention to the ending of those names because that clues you as to who these gods, who these guys represent. Verse six, now from among those of the sons of Judah was Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, to them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belshazzar, and Hananiah, Shadrach, and Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. So they are trying to erase their connection to their God and give them names after their own gods. Although the meaning of Shadrach and Meshach are unknown, allusions to the Babylonian gods, Baal and Nebo, are seen in the names Bel, Shazar, and Abednego. Again, these are examples of theoprophic names. Verse 8. But Daniel's purpose in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacy, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Did you notice there's positions that we must take? We must be bold in our st stance and we must use the wisdom of God. The king's food and drink would have been dedicated to the false gods. Verse nine. Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my Lord, the king who has appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuch had set over Daniel, Hananiah, and Michelle, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Did you notice that? That number 10 is embedded. 10 symbolizes the commandments. 10 symbolizes the word of God. We must be, we must be so attached to the word of God. We should be like a Levite who are so attached to God that we are full of the wisdom of God. And so when we are put in situations that we can answer those people wisely like Daniel did. Verse 13, then let our appearance be examined before you and let the appearance of the young men who eat the portions of the king's delicacy. And as you see fit, so deal with your servants. Jesus, Jesus taught us that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Verse 14, so he consented with them in this manner and tested them 10 days. And at the end of the 10 days, their features were appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portions of the king's delicacy. Thus, the steward took away their portions of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. Did you notice that that? The king put them in training, but God gave them knowledge. 
write that in the comments. God, give us knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Though the young men began with impressive natural abilities, that alone was not the reason for their success. God's touch upon them made the miracle. Write that in the comments. Touch me, Lord. Touch me, God. Delicacy is the Hebrew word path back. This word is one of several Persian technical terms Daniel employed. It refers to luxurious food rations from the king's own table with which Persian kings would honor a few favorite friends who were not present during the royal meal. Such gourmet gifts mark the receiver as privileged insiders. Daniel refused this offer, believing that the food and wine would defile him. Later, he prophesied that the people who would eat the king of the South's royal food quota would be the very ones who would devise plans against him and destroy him. Verse 18. Now, at the end of the days, when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Then the king interviewed them, and among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, or Azariah. Therefore, they served before the king. The cream rises to the top. God is positioning you to rise to the top. You must see yourself standing out among the people, being the best in your field, being the best manager, being the best business person, being the best preacher, the best lawyer, the best doctor. You are being perfected by our God. Verse 20, and in all manners of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them. He found them 10 times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. Thus, Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. The occult forces were no match for the spirit of God. Modern cultic movements are merging many of these spiritual counterfeits into a contemporary revival of occultism. Their influence will continue to rise as a final showdown between Jesus Christ and Satan nears in all manners of wisdom and understanding. Believers who seek to walk in the full life of the Holy Spirit will find, as did the Hebrews, that they are 10 times better than those who pursue such practices. This date means that Daniel continued for more than 60 years, long enough to grow old in God's faithfulness and long enough to see the prophecy fulfilled that the exiles would return to their homeland. Daniel chapter two, verse one. Now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and his spirit was so troubled that his slept his sleep left him. Now we must position ourselves to be strong in prayer, consecrating ourselves, fasting and seeking the face of God so that when people who are rank, prince, leaders of our countries, governors or bosses dream dreams that trouble them, that we know that our God is the one who reveals secrets. It is possible that God's spirit troubled Nebuchadnezzar's spirit causing him to recognize the importance of the dream. Verse two, then the king gave the command to call the musicians, the astrologer, the sorcerers, sorcerers and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king and the king said to them, I have had a dream and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we will give the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, my decision is firm. If you do not make known to, to uh, make known the dream to me and its interpretations, you shall be cut in pieces and your houses shall be made an ash heap. Assuming the king remembered his dream, this was a sure test of whether his servants had genuine supernatural ability. They admit to each other in verse 11 that they do not have it. 
6, verse 6. However, if you tell the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honors. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. They answered again and said, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will give its interpretation. The king answered and said, I know for certain that you would gain time because you see that my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me, there is only one decree for you, for you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time has changed. Therefore, tell me the dream and I shall know that you can give me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, there is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord or ruler has ever Act such things of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. For this reason, the king was angry and very furious and gave a command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went out and they began killing the wise men and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Verse 14, then with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered, Arashed the captain of the king's guard who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. Daniel and his friends model unyielding faithfulness to God, even under the threat of torture and death. The history of God's people is filled with stories of those who have been willing to give their lives rather than deny their faith. May the testimonies found in this book continually remind us of God's faithfulness and his presence with those who are called to walk through this ultimate test and sacrifice. Diligently seek to walk daily in God's wisdom. Even under the threat of death, Daniel gave wise counsel. Understand that stress exposes a person's true heart and character. Verse 15. He answered and said to Arak, the king's captain, why is the decree from the king so urgent? Then Arak made the decision known to Daniel. So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. Are you seeing what's happening? Creating synergy, forming a prayer group, connecting. Turn immediate to the Lord when faced with threatening circumstances. Gather others to pray and seek God's mercy, insight, and strategy with you. Verse 18, that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning the secret so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, blessed be the name of God forever and ever for wisdom and might are his. And he changed the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O God, to my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we ask of you. For you have made known to us the king's demand. This is an excellent template for prayer. We can take this and build this within our own personal prayer arsenal. Praising and giving thanks, just as the psalmist taught us that praise and worship is our weapon. Do you see how Daniel is crafting his prayers? Daniel does not need the king's confirmation to be sure that he had heard from God. Verse 24, therefore Daniel went to Ariox, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me before the king and I will tell the king the interpretation. Then Ariox quickly brought Daniel before the king and said thus to him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah 
who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar? Belteshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream which I seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days, your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. Isn't it interesting that Daniel carries the same technology of Joseph? Remember, God gives us prophetic insight and we must covet earnestly the best gift. Understand, covet to understand prophecy. Covet to understand the word of God. Be bold in giving glory to God when he enables you to overcome and otherwise impossible situation. Believe that our God works miracles. In the latter days refers to the future from Nebuchadnezzar throughout the remainder of human history. Prophetic dreams. Nebuchadnezzar saw the comprehensive history of four successive world empires spanning centuries. Babylon, gold, head, Persia, silver, chest and arms, Greece, bronze, belly and thighs, Rome, iron legs, followed by the feet of iron and clay. An apt description of today's unstable global community. It remains for the stone from heaven to strike the feet, collapsing the entire statue and to become a mountain that fills the earth, the second coming as the prophesied earthly power come and go. In contrast, the kingdom of Christ will come and remain forever. Truly, your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets. As for you, verse 29, O king, thoughts came to your mind while you on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. But as for me, this secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living, but for our sake, who make known the interpretation to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your heart. Did you notice how he positioned himself in humility? He was not cocky. He was not pretentious, but humble. God resists the proud, the arrogant. And he gives grace to the humble. So we must follow the pattern of these prophets. We must look into the lives of these examples and import these qualities into our hearts. Verse 31. You, O king, were watching and behold a great image. This great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you and in its form was awesome. The matter of understanding the various kingdoms of the great image had led to many diverse opinions. The two most common understandings are that it represents either four successive kingdoms, the Babylonian, Medo-Persian, Grecian, and Roman, or four successive reigns, kings over one kingdom, Babylon, the reign of Nebuchadnezzar through Nab Nabonidus. The differences lie in the fact that the Hebrew word for kingdom can also be translated reign. Clearly, however, the images represents governments over which God has ultimate sovereignty. Whatever their identity, before God's power, they are frail. They have feet of clay. God alone is the ultimate sovereign of history, both in Daniel's day and throughout this age. Verse 32. This image head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partially of iron and partly of clay. You watch while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image of his feet on his feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floor. The wind carries them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. 
The stone cut without hands represents God's sovereign power over history, a sovereignty that is implemented through human rulers. To Daniel's immediate readers, this stone would have been King Cyrus, who invaded Babylon, brought it under the dominion of the Medes, and was used by God to release the Hebrews to return to Jerusalem. The fact that it is described as ultimately becoming a great mountain that filled the whole earth shows the long range development of the stone imagery. Hence, the stone ultimately prefigures Jesus Christ, God's consummate ruler over all government and all history. Upon his return, he shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and consume all these kingdoms. Verse 36. This is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are the king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you a kin kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them in your hands and has made you ruler over them all. You are his head of gold. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Whereas you saw the feet of and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the king shall be divided, yet the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partially of iron and partially of clay, so the kingdom shall be partially strong and partially fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to an other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. The originator of this kingdom, the God of heaven, and its permanent existence distinguished it from the previous one. Verse 45, inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. Then, the key, then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, prostrate before Daniel, and commanded that they should present an offering and incense to him. The king answered Daniel and said, truly our God, your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings and the revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. So we see the principle established here that God is making himself known among the nations. Nebuchadnezzar's response does not constitute a con conversion, only an addition to his pantheon of gods and reshuffling of their positions. Verse 48. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts, and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. Also, Daniel petitioned the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon, but Daniel sat in the gate of the king. Proverbs chapter 5. What a revelatory passage. My son, pay attention to my wisdom. This is important. We must pay attention to the scriptures. We must prioritize studying the scriptures. And many of you, unfortunately, allow the enemies to steal away your time. So many other things are pressing. So many other things are more important to you than studying the words. You must get up early and read. God will hold you accountable. There are things that God wants you to accomplish. And the only way that you will discover the secrets is by studying his word. Lend your ear to my understanding that you may preserve discretion and your lips may keep knowledge. 
listen to and do not stray from this wise instruction. Run, keep away from the adulterer and the prostitute. Do not allow your heart to be drawn to their ways. Remain faithfully devoted to the one you marry. Let the love of your spouse alone satisfy you. Verse three. For the lips of an immoral woman or man, in case for you women, drip honey and her mouth is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as warm wormwood, sharp as a two edged sword. Her feet goes down to death. Her steps lay hold of hell. Lest you ponder her path of life. Her ways are unstable. You do not know them. Therefore, hear me now, children, my children. And do not depart from the words of my mouth. Remove your way far from her and do not go near the door of her house. Do you see the adulterous woman? This is a spirit. And we must understand just as we learn in um, earlier in the scriptures, in um, the book of Numbers, how Balaam taught the king of the Moabites, how to seduce Israel, to use holotry, to use seduction, to weaken them. So we know that when you sin, the sin of adultery, of fornication, you sin against your own body. The stock picture of the seductress ends with a warning. This is the second reference to the immoral woman. Wormwood a plant known in ancient world for its bitterness. Verse nine, lest you give your honor to others and your ears to the cruel one. You cannot release your honor, your strength, your virtue. Lest aliens be filled with your wealth and your labors go down to the house of a foreigner. Now we see how the devourer gets into your life and ravage you and bring you to complete ruin. And you're more and you mourn at last when your flesh and your body are consumed. Disease, blood diseases infiltrating your body, venereal diseases infiltrating your body and say how I have hated instructions and my heart despised correction. I have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor inclined my ear to those who instructed me. I was on the verge of total ruin in the midst of the assembly and congregation. To ignore the warning of verse eight brings remorse and misery. If King Solomon's son were to involve himself with foreign women, the literal sense of this verse is clear. However, there is application to anyone whose hands his purity to a physical or spiritual seducer. Verse 15, drink water from your own cistern and running water from your own well. Drink from your own well, my son. Be faithful and true to your wife. Fidelity safeguards your marriage. First, with metaphor, water, fountain, stream. Then with literal description, faithfulness in marriage is called for. Verse 16. Should your fountains be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be only your own and not for strangers with you. Let your fountains be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth as a loving deer and a graceful doe. Let her breast satisfy you at all times and always be enraptured with her love. For why should you, my son, be enraptured by an immoral woman and be embraced in the arms of a seductress? For the way, for the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord and he ponders all his paths. His own iniquity entraps the wicked man and he is caught in the cords of his sin. He shall die for lack of instructions and in the greatness of his folly, he shall go astray. Know that God sees all the things that we do. Turn away from iniquity and sin. It will trap you and keep you captives like one who is bound with a strong rope never hidden from God. The sinner comes to a pitiful end. He will die for lack of self-control. He will be lost because of his great foolishness. Instruction is the word muzar. Instruction, chastisement, warning. It is discipline that teaches one how to live correctly in the fear of the Lord. And this is why we study because the word is full of discipline and correction. John 
chapter 11. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Beth Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Believe in Jesus, who is the resurrection and the light. The raising of Lazarus from the dead was a demonstration of the glory of God. Again, God is making known his name among the people. It was a demonstration of the glory of God and showed Jesus' power over death. We no longer need to fear death because Jesus has overcome it and offered us eternal life. Bethany was located about two miles east of Jerusalem. During the final week before the crucifixion, Jesus spent considerable time there with his friend Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. Another example of divine sovereignty amid human suffering and demonstrating God's purposes and grace through Jesus' responses. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is, excuse me, verse three. Therefore, the sisters sent him saying, Lord, behold, he who you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, the sick, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the son of God may be glorified through it. We must ascertain insight from God regarding different things that we encounter. Certain things happen to demonstrate the glory. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Another example of divine sovereignty. Verse six, so when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Jesus's delay of two days underscores what he had taught consistently, namely that his marching orders came exclusively from his father. Neither the need of his closest friends nor the fury of his enemies determined his action. Verse seven, then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you and are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in a day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. These things he said. And after that, he said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. The word friend is the word philos. Compare philosophy, philology, philharmonic an adjective used as a noun denoting a loved one, beloved, affectionate friend. The verb is phileo, which describes a love of emotions and friendship. Phileos thus has a congeniality about it. Verse 12, then the disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Then Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the light. And he who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. The fifth I am pronouncement declares Jesus to be the resurrection and the life. Verse 26, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Jesus said to him, 
Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God, who is to come into the world. And when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, the teacher has come and is calling for you. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Now, Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, she is going to the tomb to weep there. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Do you see the emotion? He groaned and he wept. We too must take on these, these virtues of weeping and interceding for our loved one who may not be physically dead, but spiritually dead. Verse 36, then the Jews said, see how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone laid against it. The raising of Lazarus was not a resurrection from which followed endless physical life. That was reserved for the father to initiate in his own son's resurrection thereby in inaugurating a new order of life to which all those in Christ are still looking forward in hope. Jesus restored Lazarus to physical life, which would cease at his subsequent death. As with all others who have died in Christ, Lazarus awaits the bodily resurrection promised to all who are Christ's people. Groaning is the Greek word embrymate, Embremeome, derived from in, in, and brami, strength. The word is used to express anger, to indicate a speaking or acting with deep feeling and for stern admonishment. Verse 39, Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? We must anticipate God putting us in moments, in times, in places, and situations that the glory of God may manifest. Understand that the glory of God is revealed to those who believe. Verse 41. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I say this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now, when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. God is setting us up for a big setup. God is putting us in situations that the glory of God may be demonstrated that others may believe. Verse 46, but some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, what shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. He who tries to save his life will lose it. The only thing that the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees were interested in was their little accumulation of property and wealth and notoriety. They were not interested in a move of God. They were interested in their own self-preservation. Verse 49, and one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all. 
Caiaphas was high priest during AD 18 to 36, verse 50. Nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. Do you see a prophetic word is coming out of his mouth? Although he's conspiring, and he's plotting to murder the Christ. He has no power to take his life. Jesus lays down his life, but yet God uses Caiaphas to speak a prophetic, accurate word that one man should die for the people. Verse 51, now this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and not for the nation only, but also that he would gather together in one of the children of God who were scattered abroad. Nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. Now, verse 52, and not for the nation only, but also he would gather together in one children of God who were scattered abroad. Then from that day on, they plotted to put him to death. Therefore, Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there into the country near the wilderness to a city called Ephraim. And there remained with his disciples and the Passover of the Jews was near and many went from the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then they sought Jesus and spoke among themselves as they stood in the temple. What do you think? That he will not come to the feast? Now, both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a command that if anyone knew where he was, he should report it, that they might seize him. This is at least the third Passover John mentions and undoubtedly supports the claim that Jesus' ministry covered approximately three years. What a word, great word. We are learning so much, gathering so much. I exhort you to continue pressing strong. Thank you for joining Dr. Earl for today's broadcast. Please be sure to follow us on our website at anthonyearl.org. To make a ministry donation, you can visit anthonyearl.org and click on the donation tab, or you can text to give. Simply text the word GIVE to 773-245-1640. Follow the broadcast on YouTube and join our Facebook group, Anthony Earl Ministries, Discover Prophetic Truth in Scripture. This program airs daily at 8 a.m. Pacific, 10 a.m. Central, 11 a.m. Eastern Time. 